Chapter sixty six of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, July two thousand twelve. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter sixty six. Lady Huntingdon. Born seventeen o seven, died seventeen ninety one. Isaac Taylor. The broad facts of this noble lady's history afford ground enough for the repute she has enjoyed as a woman of much tact and ability, of great energy, and of a munificent temper, while the use she made of her influence and fortune for the promotion of the Methodistic movement, that is to say, of Christianity itself, sufficiently attests her piety and zeal. It must also be inferred, from the circumstance of her having retained the friendship and regard of many among the leading persons of her time through a long period of years, that she possessed qualities of mind and attractions of manner that were of no ordinary sort. For it is certain that those who ridiculed or even hated her Methodism still yielded themselves, in frequent instances, to her personal influence. So far an idea of Lady Huntingdon may be gathered from facts that are beyond doubt. There is, however, so little that is discriminative in the extant eulogies of her friends and correspondents, or of her biographers, and there is so little that bears a clearly marked individuality in her own letters, that a distinct image of her mind and temper is not easy to obtain. As to the position assigned to her among the founders of Methodism, it is due to her, rather on the ground of what she did for it as patroness, which was almost immeasurable than because she imprinted upon it any characteristics of her own mind. Calvinistic Methodism was not her creation. In the center of the brilliant company of her pious relatives and noble friends, and with a numerous attendance of educated and episcopally ordained ministers, and, beyond this inner circle, a broad penumbra of lay preachers chosen by herself, and educated, maintained, and employed at her cost, and acting under her immediate direction, she seems to sit as a queen. Something of the regal style, something of the air of the autocrat, was natural to one who, with the consciousness of rank, and with the habitude of one accustomed to the highest society, was gifted with a peculiar governing ability, and was actually wielding an extensive influence over men and things. It would have been wonderful indeed if nothing of the sort had been perceptible in her manner and style, yet that her main intention was pure and beneficent, and that ambition was not her passion, will be felt and confessed by every candid reader of her letters. Her letters indicate much business-like ability, and they show always a pertinent adherence to the matter in hand. They are therefore more determinate by far than Whitefield's, and indeed are little less so than Wesley's, whose letters are eminent examples of succinct determinativeness. They bespeak an unvarying and genuine fervor, and a simple-hearted onward tendency toward the one purpose of her life, the spread of the gospel, and the honor of her Savior. Lady Huntingdon's are, moreover, marked by often repeated, but not to be questioned, professions of the deep sense she had of her own unworthiness and unprofitableness. Such are the ingredients, few and perpetually recurrent, of these compositions, a severe monotony, not severe in the sense of harshness, is their characteristic. Yet Lady Huntingdon was always the object of a warm personal affection with those who were nearest to her. With them it is always our dear Lady Huntingdon, and putting out of view formal eulogies, it is unquestionable that, if she governed her connection as having a right to rule it, her style and behavior, like Wesley's, indicated the purest motives and the most entire simplicity of purpose. This, in truth, may be said to have been the common characteristic of the founders of Methodism, especially of the two Wesleys, a devotedness to the service and glory of the Saviour Christ, which none who saw and conversed with them could question. End of chapter 66